Welcome to Wadsworth History on Film, a program presented by the Wadsworth Area Historical Society and designed to record the oral history of Wadsworth for posterity. I'm Caesar Creator, your host, and our guest today is Pastor Roger Loomis from the First Assemblies of God Church in Wadsworth, and he's going to be telling us all about the history of the First Assemblies of God Church here as it started some years ago in Wadsworth. As we know, we have been trying to get a history of each of the churches, and out of 25 churches, Pastor Lemus's is only the 11th one that we have. So those of you out there who would like to have your, your church um, um, chronicled for history, please, please, please come forward. We'd be very happy to interview you for the, uh, the history of your church. Pastor Lemus, first of all, thank you for coming, because uh, as I indicated to others before, the uh, prospects of getting people to come in and talk about their churches <laughs> has been very difficult. Well, Over the fine. past two years, you're the, only the 11th person to do so, so I'm grateful for that. Before we start on the history of the church, how about telling us a little bit about Pastor Roger Loomis? I know that you were not born as a as a minister, you got <laughs> were born, and then somewhere along the line you became a minister, and somewhere right. along the line you came to Wadsworth. Tell us who you are, who your uh, wife is, who your children are, uh, what you do, and just everything. Start from birth. If you're not too sensitive about your age, you might tell us when you were born and where. Well, thank you. It's my privilege to be here today, Mayor Carino. And I was born in Asheville County in 1956. and. Uh, grew up in the Assembly of God Church when we, when we attended church and uh, was converted at youth camp at the age of 14 and uh, felt the call into ministry at that time in my life and uh, after graduating from high school in 1974 I pursued uh, Bible College in Springfield, Missouri and uh, during those four years met my wife uh, Lori and uh, from there we went to Alabama as youth pastors her parents were living in Alabama at the time, and so we, we followed them to Alabama and uh, became his, my, uh, my father-in-law's associate pastors. And then uh, from there, we uh, took a church in Kernersville, North Carolina, which is near Winston-Salem. And then we went back to Alabama and uh, pastored the church that we youth pastored. They, they called us back and invited us to be their senior pastors. And we, uh, we stayed in the South for a, a total of, uh, I think, 13, 14 years. And uh, came back to Ohio back in 1994. We uh, took a church in Burton, Ohio, and stayed there four years. And uh, then the church here in Wadsworth called us in May of 1998 and asked us if we would possibly come down and interview and as, uh, for the pastorate here. We came down and uh, it was a good mix and, uh, and uh, we've been here almost two years now and we absolutely love it. It's a great church. Pastor, if I do my arithmetic right, that means that you're 44 years of you're age, right? You're exactly right. Okay, 44 years of age, you went from A to Z or from birth to 44 in about 10 seconds here. <laughs> How about stopping along the way and telling us whom you married, what she does, children and so forth? I married uh, a pastor's daughter uh, who grew up in Indiana. He uh, pastored all over the, the state of Indiana until 1976 when he took a church in Gadsden, Alabama. And uh, I met Lori at, at Evangel University where we both attended. And Lori has a last name which is? Her um, maiden name was Owens. Owens. Lori Owens. Yes. O-W-E-N-S. We that, spell everything on this program. That's correct. So that, uh, <laughs> Owens and um, she's obviously the same age as you probably. So we're you the, to we're the same age. Mm -hmm. um, she was born in 56 as well. So you went to the went to school together. That's correct. So now, uh, in addition to that, um, does Lori do anything else besides uh, pastor at the present time? Well, I, I tell folks everywhere down through the years that uh, God gave uh, gifts to everyone, but He He gave Lori more than her share. She's a <laughs> more than her she's share. a very gifted woman, uh, not because she's my wife, but she she really is. She's uh, gifted musically. Uh, she's a teacher. She, uh, she's a wonderful pastor's wife. Uh, she's done everything in the church but uh, head up men's ministries. I mean, she just, she's just called uh, to do the Lord's work and, and does a marvelous job and is a, has been a tremendous help me to me. But she is ministry. a minister as well. She's a minister. She's a pastor as well. And, uh, we Has she ever had her own church? No. You've always uh, worked together? Always worked together. Okay. What about children? 
We have uh, four children, um, a daughter who was married last year and uh, now resides in Norton with her, along with her husband, Matt. Uh, her name is Sarah. And then we have a son who's 18 who graduates this year. From Wazwell High School. Uh, our children are homeschooled, actually. Well, homeschooled, okay. We're, we're both certified teachers in addition. And so we, uh, we chose to homeschool our children, um, not because we're on a campaign against any uh, system. We just, uh, with our schedule as crazy as it is and as involved as it is, uh, homeschooling just fit our, our needs. Who does more of the teaching, you or your business? Well, actually, my wife does. I, uh, I help uh, with some of the subjects that uh, she doesn't feel competent with. And her certification is in what, elementary or Elementary secondary? education. And your certification is in? Uh, high school English and journalism. Journalism and English. And mm -hmm. uh, who teaches the math? And the she does the math. She does the math. I'm doing good to balance my checkbook. Okay. So, so she does the math. So what she does then is to teach even high school math? Yes, sir. And she's able to do that too? Well, if, uh, if we are lacking in those areas, we typically find someone in our church who, is, uh, who has majored in those areas mm -hmm. and uh, can pro provide tutoring services for us. And so it's worked out nicely for us. The homeschooling process has been much more popular recently than it was in earlier yes. days. Yes, Much, much more popular. And um, I think that the percentage of increase is phenomenal. I don't know, even know what it is, but I know right. it's a tremendous amount. Um, you said that it was not a statement against the schools, but what would you believe to be the advantages of the homeschooling? Uh, would it be so that you could have a, um, shall we say, a, an influence spiritually as well as educationally? Well, I appreciate that question. Uh, we're asked that question a lot as pastors, and, and, and we really are not on a campaign against anything, but we felt right from the, right from the beginning that uh, influence is 90% of life. And uh, if we could pour our values and our influence into our children, um, not that we're opposed to any outside of that, but uh, we felt that education is, is uh, not only a, a factual thing, but it's teaching children where to go for resources. And I, I think an educated person is one who knows where to go if he needs information, uh, rather than uh, quoting everything or memorizing everything. And in addition to that, we felt that the influence, because initially God gave the wife and the mother the influence in the home. And, and my wife provides a wonderful influence to our children. And, and the older they get, uh, I'm amazed at this concept and what I see happening. My children are products of, of my wife and, uh, and hopefully myself, but we're pouring our, who we are into them. And uh, that's scary in some instances, but, but uh, overall, uh, we're seeing some, what we feel to be uh, very well-rounded, grounded children. Now, Pastor, you mentioned two of your children Sir. If you want to have a happy home life when you leave this program today, <laughs> you better mention the other two. That's exactly right. We have a 14-year-old son who, uh, who he's the sports enthusiast in our home. And then uh, we have a 7-year-old daughter who loves school and loves, loves it all. And, and she just got back her test scores. And uh, she's at least two and three years above every oh, subject. Oh, wonderful. Uh, because she just uh, she's a self motivator. Self motivated. That's yes. wonderful. That's good. We'll come back to your family in a few minutes because there's some other personal questions we want to ask about those sure. people. But um, tell us about the first Assembly of God Church in Wadsworth when it was started. Who started it? Uh, who were some of the first um, members? Were where it was and all of that kind of thing. Well, actually, um, I preached the funeral for the last living member, charter member about a month ago. And who was that? That was Hilma Buckingham. Oh, yes, yes. She, uh, she was a charter member of First Assembly back in 1930 uh, when the church originated um, on East Street uh, in a building which they called the Tabernacle. The Tabernacle, yes, that's right. And uh, from there they went to, I think, two or three other locations in town. Uh, one, uh, the old Opera House. Mm -hmm, the the on, Joe Bender Opera House. Yes, sir. And then they met there for a while. And then they moved to the south end of town um, on Main Street, South Main Street, and that building is no longer uh, in existence. That's right. Mm -hmm. But uh, a man by the name of Reverend Celentano mm -hmm. uh, pastored that church, and during his tenure there, he relocated the church to uh, 
its present location on uh, 94 North, north of town. And uh, I hear tell the stories, actually, of the, of the people that, uh, you know, as the stories are handed down. Uh, Mrs. Buckingham, of course, passed away a month ago, but her children, uh, some of her children are still in the church. Mm -hmm. And they tell me about the days when, uh, when the church was built there on, on uh, 94, north of town. And uh, when Pastor Celentano bought that property, people looked at him and said, you've got to be kidding. This, why would you go clear north of town? It was just nothing but cornfields. And, and I believe they said there was one store. Yeah, right across uh, the street. Is that right? Dress, dress Market. And uh, Dress was the name of the, the family. I mean, it was a oh, grocery I store. Okay, I, I didn't know that. And uh, they said the church was surrounded by open fields and at times cornfields and and uh, they questioned his uh, decision at that time. But uh, obviously it was in the, uh, the Lord knows more than we do. Yes, and, I think we can, uh, we can depend upon that one. <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure. And he, uh, he placed the church, I think, in one of the most uh, wonderful locations in town. I don't think you could get a better location. Not that you're interested in doing this, but I'm sure that some developer would love to have that piece of property that you have. Well, we certainly have had the phone calls. <laughs> no, and no I'm positive that you can probably get a little bit of, uh, of, a, of a return for your investment. Yes, absolutely. Um, the, um, it happens to be propitiously located where everyone wants to, be, wants to develop right now. Yes. When your church was on at the Tabernacle, and that was 1932 and so forth, um, was there a, um, do you have any history of, in your own mind, or from recollections of other people's minds, of what the church was like and how it was regarded at that time? Uh, I think uh, the church obviously was called the Tabernacle, mm -hmm. and it was not a, an assembly of God church at that time. Uh, it was, I think, regarded as many of our early assemblies of God works were or Pentecostal works Pentecostal were. Pentecostal works, right. Um, the, uh, they originated out of the holiness movement, mm -hmm. uh, the late 1800s, and the Assemblies of God were formulated in 1914 in Hot Springs, Arkansas. And the movement spread across the country, and many times the churches would not take on the name Assemblies of God. They would uh, take on more of an independent flair. And the tabernacle was, it was typical of what, what the early Pentecostals did back in those years. And uh, they were uh, w what I refer to as ultra-conservative, uh, very traditional uh, holiness people. Uh, their concept of holiness, for the most part, was uh, dealt with the exterior part of their lives, their dress. Doing nothing for fear that anything would be uh, offensive. Exactly. Their conduct uh, was a part of that. And uh, they, uh, they preached a lot on holiness. Uh, there was a lot of hellfire preached back in those years. Um, they are very good, godly people, um, and then typically, it's it's evolved into more of a what I what I hope to be a balanced approach to preaching the gospel, and we still preach holiness and all that, but but uh, we believe that we need to be relevant in our society. The recollections that I have of the tabernacle, or people who went to the tabernacle, um, were somewhat. Exaggerated, I'm certain. However, uh, as I can recall, particularly as an elementary and a high school student, mm -hmm. the people who would go there would talk about an emotional kind of outburst, yes. an emotional kind of interaction. Yes. Um, that has not really been a portion of what the the uh, present church is. Is that correct? Well, one of the accusations leveled against Pentecostalism in general. Is is the the idea that we we stress the emotional aspect of the Christian faith too much, and and I think that those uh, um, accusations have been well founded in some cases. Um, Although the word too much is a value judgment. Well, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. I think they were very very well meaning people, and and I tell my people even to this day that if you're going to shout in church on Sunday. And, and clap your hands and raise your hands and praise the Lord audibly, then uh, if you're going to jump on Sunday night, walk straight on Monday. Walk straight on Monday. And uh, don't do it just for the sake of doing it, doing it as a heartfelt expression mm -hmm. of praise to the Lord. But the early Pentecostals were known for, we, we, we gained the name Holy Roller somewhere along the line. And I've never seen that happening. I've been in the church for 30 years or longer, and I've never seen anybody roll down the aisle. 
Uh, I, I think that was one of those things that somebody, an expression that somebody and coined. The exaggeration of it, yes. That was an exaggerative type of thing. But uh, there were some abuses, obviously, in, in, the, in the Pentecostal church and have been over the years and, and probably in some cases still uh, some abuses going on. But uh, my, my heart uh, at First Assembly is to preach the gospel in, in a simple fashion and to uh, allow people to respond to the Lord as their personality dictates. And of course, uh, typically in a Pentecostal church, the, the worship is more upbeat, the music is more upbeat. We do have hand clapping and hand raising, and, and we have uh, uh, music that's, um, we draw from more of a contemporary flair, although we still do use the hymnals. Uh, and we do allow for a more demonstrative demonstration in the services. But it all comes back to uh, your relationship to the Lord and, and living the faith from day to day. And uh, I tell them that's, that's, the, that's the dessert. Uh, but typically, and back in those early years, uh, there was a whole lot of shouting that went on. You know? Well, you know, um, I am not Pentecostal, but one of the things that I respect about the Pentecostals is the fact that they do have this emotionalism. I've oftentimes defended this practice by making some kind of a comparison between what they do and what people do at basketball games and yes. football games. Now, right. I don't know of anyone who goes to a football game and sits there with his hands folded <laughs> prayerfully. Exactly he right. shouts and he rates. Why? Because he's excited about what is happening. Exactly right. If a person is excited about what is happening within him, his own spirit, yes. or if he is excited and happy about the fact that he is within the presence of the Lord, why is it so odious for people to raise their hands? Why is it so odious for them exactly right. to make a noise? I yes. mean, that's just very natural. It's very yes. normal for people to do that. I don't happen to do that myself, but uh, I have nothing but respect for people who want to do that. That's perfectly all right. That's, that's very kind of you. And as a matter of fact, I've, I've said almost those identical words from my pulpit. Is that right? And, uh, but we have people in our church that are very what I call laid back and quiet and and uh, my my point being that that come to church and be who you are and uh, express yourself within the limits of your personality and and let it go with that some years ago I was <clears throat> with a group of older people <laughs> they're my age now but they were older <laughs> people at that time and <clears throat> they were all women and one of them um, um, made some kind of a comment about the fact that I was beating my foot to the music, you know. She said, <laughs> well, you know, a gentleman really doesn't show that kind of emotion in public. Right. And right. a lady would never dare show that kind of emotion in public. Yes. Well, when the music plays, I beat my foot. <laughs> and I thought to myself how horribly uh, frustrating that would be to have to feel that you could not show any emotion simply because that's, you were a lady or a gentleman. And I'm exactly not so right. sure that that definition is what it is. Right. I'm taking more of your time and I don't want to, I, but I wanted no, to help fine. defend that aspect of Thank it. You. A little bit more than who were some of the other people that we remember as being part of the, of the early days of the um, uh, Somebody's of God Church. Several of the pastors that uh, I, I only know them by name. Um, I, I never had the privilege of meeting them. Um, the Ryans, the Thompsons, the Hawthorns. Uh, these are some of the uh, the men that pastored here. Mm -hmm. Actually, the McKinleys. Harold McKinley was the very first pastor at the Tabernacle, and then there was a succession of pastors. I'm the thirteenth pastor in their seventy-year history. Mm -hmm. But uh, my recollection goes back to John Palmer. Um, back in the uh, early 70s. He was a stately man, a very uh, dedicated man who uh, was renowned as a man of prayer. And as a matter of fact, his sons, John and Jim, graduated from Wadsworth High School. Mm -hmm. And John is pastoring a, a, a rather large church in Des Moines, Iowa today, a church of, I think, two or 3,000 people. And uh, Jim, their other son, is pastoring in Columbus, Ohio. And so uh, they, uh, they contact me from time to time. And then uh, after that, uh, more recent history, the longest tenure has been Roger Larison, mm -hmm. who pastored the church uh, from 1981 to 1998. Give us a little bit of a background about this man who was just so wonderfully, uh, everyone thought of him as being a wonderful person. Tell yes. us a little about uh, Pastor Larison. 
Pastor Larison is, is a dear friend of mine. He's, he's been so supportive, and he is a very gifted man. He's, he's, a, he's an administrator. Uh, he, he loves people, a very kind man, very gentle, spirited man. Uh, he led First Assembly into some major building programs that's, during that's his tenure. That's what I to hear you say. Tell us about that building program and the impetus that that then provided for future building programs. Yes. He uh, actually, the Celentano, Pastor Celentano, mm -hmm. actually relocated the church to its present location, and he built the original sanctuary, which was rather a tiny structure. Yes, it was. And then uh, Pastor Larison came along uh, probably 20 years later, and um, he built the uh, educational wing, and, uh, and then he built the, uh, remodeled the entire sanctuary, mm -hmm. added on to it, as I recall, and then uh, he built the fellowship hall. And, uh, Actually, about quadrupled. Yes. The entire uh, edifice at the, from the beginning. That's exactly. The, right. the thing that I was looking for was the one that you just mentioned here. That was the education wing. Yes. And how did that then impact upon the um, future of this church? Uh, I think that um, the answer is probably rather transparent. You know, the fact that you mm -hmm. educate small children, then you have them right. as, as adults. Right. Um, if I were going to identify a big change in the Pentecostal Church or the Assemblies of God Church, it would probably be, would be the advent of more children being in, in, entered into it and taught. Yes. yes. Am I correct in that? You're exactly right. Because at one time, the students at Wadsworth High School and the surrounding elementary schools would, out of curiosity, go to the tabernacle to see the old people. Of course, they're only about 35 yes. or 40 years old, but they were old people right. who were involved with this, and no kids were there. Exactly at least that's right. what they told us, that there were no kids were that's there. That's right. Uh, we were never permitted to do that. We would have never permitted them to do anything which would have even so much as suggested making fun of somebody else. Yes. You know, uh, yes. My parents were extremely strict about that. You don't make fun of anybody. <laughs> um, and... Um, I'm not positive that the kids who were there were making fun of them so much as they were just amused by a different approach. Right, sure. So um, there weren't too many children there, but now you have a lot of children. Yes. Now, uh, what is your program that um, attracts these children? I think that two or, two or three things, as you said earlier, uh, probably would, uh, would suffice here, but uh, just I'd like to hear your, your point of how they attract the children. Uh, you, you have a good, uh, I think, summation of, of Pentecostalism. Uh, you have a good perspective on it. In the early years, um, the movement was uh, typically drew the older element. Um, the younger element kind of shied away from it because of the legalism that came into the Pentecostal church. Uh, the list of can't do's and couldn't do's was longer than you could do, you know. And uh, I jokingly tell people back in those years that if it was fun, it was sinful, mm -hmm. you know. And, and we thank, thankfully we've moved away from that mentality, and and uh, we off we try to offer a balanced program to the for the community. We offer children's ministries, youth ministries. Uh, we have a preschool at First Assembly now. Uh, wonderful right. preschool. This is this is you're going exactly where I would like to have you go because yes. this is what is going to be the right the, the future of the, of the yes church. and. Uh, 72 children enrolled this year. Mm -hmm. and, and they're uh, not all Pentecostal either. No, they're from all over the community and from several faiths. Uh, and, uh, and that's something you wouldn't have seen years ago in Pentecostal churches. No. We, were, we were fairly exclusivistic back in those years. And if you didn't believe it our way, then, then you weren't quite up to snuff, you know. And uh, we've gotten away from that, and I'm grateful for that. Um, I'm president of the Ministerial Association at this present time. And uh, years ago, you would never have seen an Assemblies of God pastor even showing up at a ministerial meeting because that was seen as, as compromise. And uh, I believe that there's one body, one Lord, one baptism, and, and that we're all in this thing together. We just have different expressions and different modes of worship. And uh, I enjoy that aspect of ministry. But we're reaching out to very, very many different elements of the community. Uh, we, we have a lot of young couples in the church. Typically, you would not have seen that years ago. Young couples shied away from, from a church that was marked uh, by ultra-conservatism. The um, <clears throat> various people we have had on our program who has talked to us about the Pentecostal church or the, the uh, tabernacle, yes. um, at least a half dozen or so have mentioned in the past two or three years we've been doing this, 
they would identify the congregation as being about 25 or 30. That's what they would say. Because the tabernacle wasn't very big. Right. Oh, tell us where the tabernacle, for the, for the sake of uh, history, tell us where the tabernacle was. You know, uh, I have asked around and no one really remembers where it stood. Oh, it was on East Street. East, well, East, oh. between East and um, South Lyman. East okay. and South Lyman. In right. kind of a valley. All right. And it was a um, frame building. Yeah, typically, back in those years, uh, Assembly of God or Pentecostal churches were, were on what we say the other side of the tracks. Uh, they were oh, typically. This, is, this was north of the tracks. Is that right? <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> they were typically frame buildings, clapboard buildings uh, with uh, wood heaters mm -hmm. and uh, not very uh, becoming. Well, they, this was. Uh, uh, I wouldn't mind having that little building on my, on my property right now. It's a nice little building. It was long and narrow. Is that right? Well, yeah, well, uh, most buildings are longer than they are, or, than they are wide, right. but it was long and narrow. And um, the uh, stories about the inside, it was extremely Spartan, extremely yes. Spartan. I mean, just nothing there right. except chairs right. and a wooden floor, and exactly that was right. about it. They did have electric lights. Later on, they had electric lights. Yes. And um, <laughs> they were um, they were drawn there on excuse me days other than Sunday. Yes. Now is that something which is different from? That's that's changed somewhat. Back in those years, they had what they called camp meeting yeah. quite a bit. Uh, Pentecostals were were well known for their brush arbor meetings back in the very early years. And what are brush arbor meetings? Those actually are meetings that are held outdoors particularly in the summertime, under trees, under a thicket of trees or whatever. And uh, a, a traveling evangelist would come through and, and people would come from many miles around uh, back in those years. And, and we still have a, a camp meeting tradition, but obviously it's, it's in keeping with the times. Of course, sure. There are more. One of the things that um, <clears throat> always impressed little kids was the fact that these people spoke in tongues. Yes. And I don't make light of that at all, but the difference between their, the, the early days, say for mm -hmm. instance the early 30s in Wadsworth, mm -hmm. where they spoke in tongues, and the, the um, sophistication level of speaking in tongues today, yes. could, you, could you identify the difference between those two? Back in the early days of, of Pentecost, and of course the church has been speaking in tongues, and many, some elements of the church, since the day of Pentecost. However, that's right. That's right. Uh, Acts chapter 2. However, over the centuries, you don't see as much of that mentioned or even recorded. Mm -hmm. There were isolated events. And, and we as Pentecostals, we, we believe that the prophecy of Joel is being fulfilled and where he said, in the last days I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and daughters shall prophesy and, and so forth. And, and we believe that we're coming into that day of prophetic fulfillment where the Holy Spirit is once again pouring out upon the church. And, and we, we've seen it in the, in the uh, Catholic renewal. We've seen it in the Methodist church. It, it's not just Pentecostal people. It's a, it's, a, it's a jumping boundary, so to speak. But back in the early years of Pentecost, um, there was a lot, a lot of what we call wildfire. And uh, our ministers were, for the most part, untrained and unlearned. Good men, very well-meaning men, but did not have the, the training that that uh, was necessary to confine or to help identify what was going on. And so there was a lot of loose cannons running around and a lot of emotionalism that uh, probably should have been put in check. Mm -hmm. But uh, so uh, in the last 80 years or so, uh, 90 years, uh, our ministers have become trained. Uh, we have many Bible colleges across America. And uh, it's not that we have tried to quench what the Holy Spirit is doing but I believe we have to monitor it. We don't try to control it, but I believe we have a responsibility to monitor it. And uh, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, uh, the tongue speaking that you mentioned about, is prevalent in our, our church and, and in Pentecostal churches in general. But it's, uh, we try to teach the people uh, and, and to monitor it in a different fashion mm -hmm. than the early Pentecostals did. That's what I was referring to, the level of sophistication. You know, the... Um, <clears throat> 
uh, the, the, the child in the, uh, the candy store can just go wild yes. because he doesn't have any, any restraints. Exactly. Right. Uh, that does not necessarily mean that the candy isn't still there. Right. It's the manner in which what you approach this candy. We eat a little bit now, and then when you digest that, you eat a little bit more. Exactly right. And I think that's what you were saying concerning the, the Pentecostal, or rather the, the speaking in tongues. Could we get to some of the personalities that um, have been strong emphases in the area of the development of the Pentecostal Church or the Assemblies of God in Wadsworth since 1932 to the present day? The, uh, the, you're talking about the pastors? Well, the, uh, yeah, the pastors, of course, are strong emphases, but yes. the, the more, uh, in, more in keeping with some of the members who have been the lay leaders. Very good. Uh, many in this community know a man by the name of Chuck Lag. Oh, surely. Chuck was a Very businessman well. in our community. Very well known, very well thought of. Plumbing company. Plumbing, that's correct. And uh, his wife still mm -hmm. attends our church. And tell us a little bit about Chuck Leib and his wife, and they're up in years now. Yes, I, I never had the privilege of, of meeting Chuck Leib. I knew him quite well. And I, and I wish that I had because, he, uh, matter of fact, we have a library in our church that was, mm -hmm. that's in, uh, named in his honor. But uh, Chuck was, as I understand, a pastor's man. He was a pastor's friend, mm -hmm. and he, he stood with his pastors. He, uh, he represented his Lord and his church well in the community. In the business as well. In the business world as well. And everyone knew that he was a Pentecostal, from my understanding, and yet oh, he, he, he was met with respect. Nothing but respect. And uh, Chuck is, is one of the big names. Uh, the Buckinghams, uh, uh, as I said, I preached Mrs. Buckingham's funeral mm -hmm. some weeks ago, and her children are in the church. The Whelan family is another Whelans. Uh, a big name in, at First Assembly. They go, they go way back. I know, and all of the Whelans as well. The Brewbakers. There's now, just, there are two or three Brewbaker families, and some of them are still in the Mennonite area. Yes. And then yes. the Brewbakers. Which Brewbakers are with uh, them? I preached Helen Brewbaker's funeral about a year ago, and uh, her husband's name was Floyd. Floyd Brewbaker. I know him very yes. well. And uh, they were an integral part of First Assembly for many years. And then the others uh, were gone, of course, before I got here, and I, I, I don't recall all the names. But uh, typically, the, the church has grown so much, uh, even since I've been here, and there's a turnover. You know, uh, we're living in a very mobile society, mm -hmm. and uh, we have people come in for six months to a year, and then they get transferred back out. And so um, the church has, has taken on a different flair even since I've been here. Mm -hmm. Pastor, do you know that since 1990, 40% of all of the people in Wadsworth are brand new? Is that right? Mm -hmm. I, I believe that. So, you know, they're getting a different, um, a different mix of people, obviously. Yes. And certainly you're getting a different um, uh, number of people from the various uh, beliefs. Sure. Uh, my guess is that um, uh, as people, well, today hearing this program, my guess is that there will be some people out there who say, you know, that's what I identify with. I didn't realize this is what I was looking for. Mm -hmm. And they probably will be coming to you. And this is not the, the, the reason we have this program. Right. But that, that can't happen. Sure. The um, other question that I have regarding the, the history of the church, <clears throat> when, you were, uh, when you moved from the Tabernacle to the Bender Opera House, which is no longer here, and of course right. the Tabernacle is no longer here, nor right. is the one on South Main Street right. in Illinois here, Right. But uh, when you moved from, from those three places, uh, what happened? Was there any kind of a, of a, of a feeling of um, uh, ownership to the previous one which would cause people to leave? And then concomitantly, did you have people who did not want to be associated with the previous edifice who became members? And I know that that might be a hard question, but I think I might have some of the answers on that one. Right. Um, Again, this is only hearsay in talking with the, the family members and the children of those family members. Uh, it wasn't so much a problem moving from the tabernacle to the opera house, uh, as I understand, but there was from there to the uh, south main. A tremendous problem. There was lost a, a lot they of lost people. a good number of families. And why was that? Uh, because people identify with a building, mm -hmm. a location. That's what times. I was trying to get. That. Even over their faith, they'll they'll place their faith. Mm -hmm in jeopardy to stay in the building identify with the building <laughs> and they're not able to see the larger picture mm -hmm. to see that uh, I, th I think what happens uh, mayor is that many times people lose the vision the original vision 
I tell people that I appreciate the facility that we're in, but that I didn't come here to, to uh, man a building. I came here to build people. And, and there's nothing wrong with buildings, but uh, the church is people, not buildings. And uh, when they left from the old opera house to go to Main Street, uh, my understanding was that several families put their foot down and said, no, this is where we're staying. We're and staying. This, God gave this property to us, and, and we're, not, we're not moving. And what did they do? Uh, as far as I know, they scattered to other churches, That's or right. some of them even just quit the faith or whatever. Well, they, uh, some of them did scatter to other churches, and I think that, um, I'm not going to say because I might be wrong, but um, it, I, it had gone, it had, had been at least spoken here Mm -hmm. on this program that some of them went to the Christian Missionary Alliance Church and some yes. of them went to Baptist churches yes. and some of them just left altogether. In the South Main Street, uh, could you tell us geographically where that was for history? Uh, well, it was out south of the tracks and uh, there's a doctor's building there now um, and I can't recall the doctor's name, but the church actually set where his parking lot is. Swick. Thank you. Dr. Swick. Dr. Yes. Mm -hmm. And actually where his parking lot is, is located is where the church was located. Right. It was on Pine Street and South Main. That's correct. In the northeast corner of Pine Street, South Main. We have to do that because... I'll have to check that out. <laughs> that's, that's interesting. Yes, I think that's right. Mm -hmm. But it was, I understand, I saw a picture of it. It's a, it's a square brick building. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, uh, which was typical flat roof. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, they worshiped there for several years when Pastor Celentano got caught the vision to move north to the north side of town. The other question that I have is, what is the nationality or ethnic background, I'm sorry, makeup of the earlier um, Assemblies of God slash Tabernacle? What were the assembly, what were the, what were some of the nationality backgrounds of that? Uh, as far as nationality, I, I think, uh, I don't think that we had any immigrants in, in the sense of, of, you know, moving from other lands at that time. Um, but I will say this, that the early Pentecostals, and I'm talking of the 20th century Pentecostals, early 20th century Pentecostals were, were typically uh, low-income uh, people who, who uh, caught the, uh, the vision of uh, the Pentecostal movement and at that point in history, the Pentecostal movement very seldom drew anybody from middle to middle upper class America. It was typically a, a low income, uh, lower social economic social group, economic group that, that they reached out to. Wadsworth had several ethnic groups in this early Pentecostal. Is that right? Yes. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, um, I know some of them. Some were Italian, some were Hungarian. Um, not too many, obviously, mm -hmm. but uh, they were they they actually ascribed to it, and they were very powerful in the in the mm -hmm. church. Getting back to the present uh, edifice, uh, which is in north at north end of the town, um, a moment ago I mentioned that uh, people on this program have said that when they would peep in the door out of curiosity, they would see twenty five or thirty people. If I were to peep into the door now of the First Assemblies of God Church, there on what is it? Um, what's the name of the drive? That it's you know, it's at the corner of um, High Street and Park Center. Park Park Center right? Park Center yes. Drive. Park Center Drive. Um, how many would I see? On a typical Sunday, um, you would see three to three hundred and fifty people. Three, ten times more. Ten times more. What caused this? I think uh, I think there's several variables. Um, a lot of people, uh, particularly starting with about 1970, uh, there came a move into the American church scene where people were uh, growing weary of the, uh, uh, what was going on in America. I, th I think the unrest of the 60s, the, uh, the Vietnam War, uh, people were looking for something different. Uh, the mainline churches were, were uh, noticing a, a decline at that time, and people were looking for um, just a, a different menu. One of the things menu. that um, I, you, you may or may not know, I'm, I'm a student of religion. I, mm -hmm. I love the study of religions, and I don't care which religion. I, I happen to be a Roman Catholic myself, but I, I love to study religions. Yes. 
and to find their, their backgrounds. Um, not in Ohio, however, in another state, and it happened to be in New Jersey, mm -hmm. where they had the Assemblies of God in the neighborhood where two of our children, or our child, or one of our children and his wife lived. Mm -hmm. lived. They don't live there anymore. They have a big sign on the outside. This church preaches Bible only, <laughs> period. Mm -hmm. Do you think that there is a strong emphasis toward returning to a simplified biblical orientation rather than uh, one in which we might have modified the word to fit a more intelligent, now shouldn't they say that, a more highly cultured um, population that wants more than just plain simple? Yes. Uh, I, I think that's a good observation. I think the baby boomers mm -hmm. are particularly looking, uh, and I'm at the end of that baby boomer generation. But I produced the baby boomers. <laughs> that's, a, that's right. <laughs> but, but I think the baby boomers uh, became dissatisfied with status quo, with uh, a lot of variables there. But they began looking for uh, churches and a faith that was simple, that was easy to grasp, that was relevant to, to their family's needs. And uh, I think that um, over the past 20 years, we've seen a shift in that direction toward churches that, uh, that uh, preach a very simple gospel and yet provide a, a friendly seeker kind of uh, outreach. And uh, families today are looking for that. How does the, um, the church, that is the, um, the First Assemblies of God, and the, the answer here is going to be transparent and obvious as well, but mm -hmm. we need to have that for historical evidence because there are so many churches who won't. How does the church regard women in the ministry? Well, obviously, there, there are pros and cons on that, within, even within our own movement. Uh, my wife is a credentialed minister. Uh, the, uh, we, we do ordain women in the Assemblies of God. I'm not opposed to that. Uh, there is some opposition to that from within the church. If you want to have a home life, you better not be opposed to uh, that. That's exactly right. <laughs> but my wife is, uh, is very called and very gifted of, of the Lord. But um, we, we do st have a lot of women pastors in our movement, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of uh, problems with that, uh, particularly from the male segment. Um, a lot of people don't think that a, women, a woman should pastor a church. And... Uh, I, I won't comment on that at this point because I, I, I do have some definite ideas about it, but I have no problem with women in ministry. Uh, matter of fact, Joel prophesied that in the last days that he would pour out his spirit upon his handmaidens, and that, that means women that would be uh, raised up to uh, help preach the gospel. Do you have anything that uh, says that women are not permitted to pray in public? Not at all. Okay. No. Um, there are those who believe that the Pentecostals don't permit that, and I just want to make sure that you identify that that is not true. There are some that do not. Uh, they're very small in number and uh, very scattered. Uh, Pentecostalism is, is, is as wide as many of the other uh, branches of Christianity. You know, uh, uh, we're one, one flavor at Baskin-Robbins. You know, uh, there's many Pentecostal people in America today. Well, I'm sure that's true with every church. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, the Assemblies of God are the largest Pentecostal group in America today. Mm -hmm. But you have other wonderful Pentecostal groups. You have Four Square Gospel. You have uh, the Pentecostal Holiness Church. You have the Church of God, Cleveland, Tennessee. Church of God of Prophecy. I mean, on and on. Um, and they all differ from one another in, in some of their various practices. Some 65, 70, 65 years ago, a neighbor of mine was Pentecostal, and um, he had, and I can still remember this, he had a, a tooth that was on the, on the end of his watch fob, which he believed to be something holy. Can you explain that to us? I, I've never heard that. Mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't have a clue as to what that's about. Well. Um, if he were living now, he'd be about 125 years old also. Mm -hmm. So this goes way, way back in the Pentecostal movement, right. in the 1880s, right. 1890s. That's a new one to me. 
Uh, I do know that, you know, I watch television, uh, some of the documentaries, and uh, obviously Pentecostals have taken a bad rap in recent years, and, and people, people typically, when they think of Pentecostals, their mind goes to Jim Baker or Jimmy Swaggart or uh, Bob Tilton or some of these other men who have, who have received national acclaim, Pat Robertson, Paul Crouch, others. And, uh, and they, they throw us all in one basket, which, which, you know, if you think about that, that's, that's not a wise thing to do because uh, every, every man brings his own personality course, type. Richard Nixon was a Quaker. Yes. And someone said one time that Richard Nixon refused to embrace a woman who came up to him because he was a Quaker. I don't think that's true, but that's what was, yes. what was spoken of him. Yet Richard Nixon, uh, as we know, um, left the presidency yes. in, in somewhat dishonor, I would say. Yes. And um, I doubt seriously if um, he would have thought that embracing a woman in public, which we all do all the mm -hmm. time, sure. would, be, would, would be wrong. So, you know, people have some erroneous ideas, and then they expand upon those yes. erroneous ideas. Yes, they do. And that's the thing that bothers me a great right. deal about any of the faith. Right. Historically, in Wadsworth, the Pentecostals have been, as you say, um, self-isolated. Yes. I'm, and I'm saying the word is self because I don't think that anyone else, else would have isolated them, but they, they isolated themselves. Yeah, I believe that's right. And do you have a, a, an understanding of why our people in Wadsworth would have been self-isolated as Pentecostals? They were taught back in those years that holiness was separation from the world. Completely. And, completely. And they had a concept of the world that, that I think needed to be broadened a little bit. Um, you know, the Bible teaches us that we are not to be a part of the world. But uh, actually, the, the word world there is not talking about... Worldliness. Exactly right. And, and they equated, if it was... For example, um, my grandmother was born in 1912 and in a Pentecostal group, not the Assemblies of God, but another group. And it was a sin to cut her hair. She did not cut her hair until she was 68 years of age. And it, it almost touched the floor. And uh, the reason she did not cut her hair, because that was a sign of worldliness. Mm -hmm. And uh, she would not allow us as grandchildren to play softball on Sundays because that was worldly. That we were to honor the Sabbath and to keep it holy. And so they, they meant well. But they took the scriptures in, in, in an exaggerated form and, and did not see the whole picture. What would have caused her to cut her hair at age 67? Uh, she got tired of, of braiding it all the time. <laughs> uh, physically, she was not able to, to uh, even manage her own hair. Now, Pastor, just uh, out of curiosity, uh, whose genes did you pick up on? <laughs> Probably the same genes that I picked up on, right? <laughs> Probably. She had all that hair, and we have none. That's so unfair, but uh, life has not necessarily been fair um, in the past, and I guess this is what we have to, to accept. Right. Pastor, in the history of Wadsworth, we have had the scene come and go, uh, a great number of um, small, uh, for the want of a better word, called storefront churches. Yes. The Apostolic churches in Wadsworth never had storefronts. They were so few in number. How were they able to build the edifices that they actually, I mean, I'm, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm leading toward um, the fact that in their isolationism, they are also mm -hmm. extremely tenacious in terms of their faith yes. and giving to the faith. Yes. Would you say that the Pentecostals probably do even more than tithe? The, I appreciate these questions. Um, the Pentecostal church has always taught tithing. Mm -hmm. In other words, giving 10% of our income to the Lord and the work of the Lord. And for that reason, I think the churches were able to stay above water and, and, and to mm -hmm. go on and, and to pass that on to the next generation. And um, but back in those years, as I said, they were from the lower socioeconomic groups, and even a tithe did not represent a lot of money in those churches. Well, the reason I'm asking that question is that 
almost all of the churches which are magnificent edifices today. Yes. Beautiful. I'll take, uh, let's go to Akron. And um, irrespective of religion, St. Bernard's right. Church is just yes. a work of art. Yes, it is. Every single one of those people, with very few exceptions, were, as you described, so lower socioeconomic. Yes. Um, I'm thinking of Catholic churches now, and then I'll give, get you some Lutheran churches as well, and some Methodist churches. In the North Akron, uh, we have St. Anthony's Church, which was built for free. Mm -hmm. All labor donated, and they went to a bank in Cleveland, which was being torn down, and truck after truck, this is in the 30s and 30s, truck yes. after truck of that marble was taken down here, and it was cut, and it's a gorgeous mm -hmm. church. Mm -hmm. The um, um, High Street Church in Barberton, Methodist, a beautiful, Lovely beautiful, church. beautiful church, was done the same way, or prospered the same yes. way. Almost all of the huge churches were laid brick by brick by donated labor and so forth. And today, the only way we can build a church is to go out and have a fund drive for a million yes. dollars. And then to, now, yes. So it's that commitment. Right. And these people were committed. In addition to being committed, they were tithers. And I've heard you say today, and I knew this for a fact, that I don't care how poor those people were who were, mm -hmm. The Pentecostal people here in Wadsworth, yes. they gave everything they possibly could plus 10%. Yes. Plus more, that's right. To give that church the impetus. That's right. When Pastor Celentano moved from the south end to the north end, um, my understanding, and I knew Pastor Celentano, I knew his daughter, as a matter of fact, his mm -hmm. daughter taught in Norton. I knew Mrs. Celentano. Pastor Celentano's words when I talked with him one time when he's going to make that move and um, I think that I might have mentioned or someone mentioned well boy it's going to be expensive mm -hmm. said, well, nothing is expensive to God <laughs> and he did move that yes do you have any idea what kind of debt they might have gone into to build that very small structure at the beginning in the middle of the cornfield I can't quote you in actual dollar amounts but I do know that that uh, Brother Celentano was criticized uh, by some of the folks because they had paid their building off. They burned their mortgage mm -hmm. in the South Street, or excuse me, the South, South Main mm -hmm. Church. And they said, why would you want to move the church to the north side of town? We're debt free. And, uh, but Pastor Celentano felt within his heart that that was what God wanted them to do. And uh, they uh, bought the land, and, and I, I better not quote a figure, but it was just incredibly low. But it was still a major step of faith for those people. But because he had pastored here long enough and they trusted him, they trusted his leadership, they followed him, and uh, within no time, those people gave and gave and gave and paid that thing off in no time. And uh, that's typical of, of Pentecostals in that area. I, that's what I wanted to hear yeah. you say, that they are extraordinarily giving yes. of, that, uh, of themselves and of also of their, of their money. Um, tell us a little bit about Pastor Salentano. You say that he's a good friend of yours, and uh, tell us a little bit about his background, where he was born, and um, what he did, and so forth. Well, actually, I never met Pastor Salentano. Oh. I've, I've, uh, this is strictly hearsay. Uh, he is so respected. He was born in Italy, you know. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. He was so respected here in the community and in the church, and he was that typical Pentecostal pastor that, that maybe people here talked about. He was, he was quite demonstrative. Uh, he, um, he was not a, what you'd call a holy roller, but he, was, he let the, the church uh, express itself in Pentecost, typical Pentecostal fashion. But he was a, a tremendous man of honor. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, his word was his bond. And he has a, uh, he's very well loved here. He passed away two years ago, actually. He, was, he, he had to be fairly old. I believe they told me he was 88. Mm -hmm. When he, when he passed away, and he had he'd just been to First Assembly for a homecoming and went back to California and died at the airport. Oh. Matter of fact, he, he left here, flew to California at his home, 
And never, his never, home was never located. made it home. He died never at the airport. Never made it home. He, he died at the airport. Uh, he had one daughter. Yes. And she was a teacher. She lives in California. She taught, she taught at Norton. Yes, I understood. This is probably uh, 35, 40 years ago, yes. 35 years. Yes. Well, about 35 years ago, I would imagine. Right. And um, um, a nice, nice person. I, I don't, didn't follow her after she left mm -hmm. Norton, but I, a nice person. And his wife was a small person, <laughs> uh, but um, a very humble, right. very charming woman. Right. Very nice people. Now, we're going to run out of time quickly, but we need to get a couple of little uh, personal things in here. Okay. Um, talked about your wife, talked about your children, and you have a child who is 20? 21. 21, but no grandchildren, right? No grandchildren. You don't have any, if, you have, if you have any grandchildren, you don't mention their names, you're in trouble. <laughs> Tell us what your children do and who the, what the names are, what the, who they are. Sarah is our oldest daughter. She is, uh, as I said, 21, lives in Norton. And married? She's married to a young man that she met at uh, Bible school. Uh, their plans are to mentor under me for a season, and then uh, they're in the process of getting credentialed with the Assemblies of God. Okay, and his name is? His name is Matt. Matt. And Matt Bush. Spells the last name, U-S-H? B-U-S-H. Okay. And they will uh, work with us for a season. And then I look for them to launch out in, in their own ministry in, in a couple of years. And they're, they're a real blessing in the church right now, working with the youth at the present time. And uh, a tremendous asset. And then Adam is 18 years old. Adam has been called into ministry. He, uh, he loves the music end of things. Mm -hmm. He plays the keyboard and the drums and and. and God's gifted him with an excellent voice, and uh, he wants to uh, study to, uh, uh, or to pursue the music end of ministry, like a minister of worship or whatever. Mm -hmm. Zachary is 14. He's, uh, he is uh, a big boy. He's bigger than Dad. I used to wrestle the boys, and then I quit that because they were putting the hurt on me too much. <laughs> but uh, Zach is 14. He loves sports. And he's bigger than you. He's bigger than and I you're am. you're at least six feet one or so. I'm or? six one, and, and Zach's bigger than I am. Oh, They're boy. Bo both boys are bigger than I am. Well, you grow them big in, <laughs> in, the, in the church. <laughs> and uh, Zach loves sports, and he'll be playing for the City League this year, Wadsworth City. Mm -hmm. And then Hannah is seven, and uh, we tell folks that she... Uh, she owns the company, and, and we own stock in the company. Yeah. She's the baby, and everybody knows it. You know, and she she controls the whole thing. But uh, we're, we've been blessed with a wonderful family. Tell us a little bit about your your wife. Um, just some of the things that she has had to endure as a pastor's wife and in being a minister as well. I think Lori's biggest struggle over the years is people trying to impose upon her what they feel a pastor's wife ought to be. And Lori, if she were here today, she would tell you, I am not the typical pastor's wife. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to play that stereotype. I don't fit that stereotype. She, uh, she loves her uniqueness. She, she's not arrogant about it, but she just she tries to be transparent with people. She loves people, and she doesn't like people trying to fit her into this mold. typical pastor's mold. What, uh, what is the typical pastor's mold that she doesn't like particularly? Uh, you should be quiet, sit there, and, and not talk, and, and smile at everything, smile at everything and put up with everything, and, and uh, not that she's, uh, uh, you know, a, a fighter, but uh, she just, she certainly doesn't fit that stereotype. Well, it would be an awful waste for a person with all of her talents to remain quiet <laughs> and just smile. Well, I think so, too. So, you know, God bless her. I think that's wonderful. <laughs> Pastor, has been just wonderful today having you here because... We have not had anybody give us the history of the Assemblies of God Church at all. No one has come forward. And we're grateful to you for doing that because this will be and continues to be, I should say, and has been an integral part of our history for the past 70 years. Sure. And we need to know who these people are. We need to know why they are here. We, know, we, didn't, we need to know what brought them here and how they are going to stay here. So right. you have helped us to do that. Thank you. We come to the end of our hour each time, and this is it. So thank you again, and thank we certainly you. are just genuinely pleased to have this now as part of Wads with History on well, Film. Thank you very much. I've enjoyed it.
Welcome to Wadsworth History on Film, a program presented by the Wadsworth Area Historical Society and designed to record the oral history for Wadsworth and its posterity. Today we have the class of 1950, and I'm going to introduce them. I'll probably introduce them by their maiden names. Ralph Fisanelli, class of 1950. Donna Fried Maxson, 1950. Walter Gehring, 1950. And Virgil Coppas, 1950. And I know all of these people personally, and many of the things that they're going to say um, are going to be of interest not only to the people in the class of 1950, but to anybody else in Wadsworth, because they represent a segment of Wadsworth which is fast decaying, but so long as they're alive, they're going to be able to tell you about it. Um, Donna promises that she's not going to tell on the fellows in terms of what they did that they don't want their wives and families and all that to know. But Donna, if you want to, it's perfectly OK, because we, we can't edit it out if we have to, but we aren't going to edit anything, so anything. Let's tell a little bit about yourselves as we go here. But Virgil, let's start with you. Since we started up this end, Virgil, let's start with you. Uh, tell us who you are, where you're born, your brothers and sisters, parents, and all that kind of thing, so we get a feel for who you are. Because not only are you the class of 1950, but you're a native of Wadsworth, you're a native of Wadsworth, you're a native of Wadsworth, you're a native of Wadsworth. We can go back almost 70 years for you people. So Virgil, give us a start. My goodness, when you said 70, that kind of uh, <laughs> is a figure that hits you in the eye. It's not quite not 70 quite yet, but it soon will be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm uh, two years ahead of you fellows. That's I'll be right. 70 my next yeah. birthday. Uh, I'm Virgil Coppice. I My parents were Harold and Levon Coppice. Uh, my mother taught for 20 some years down at what's now known as Aisha Elementary. Math? Uh, she taught math? Yes. Algebra? Mm -hmm. And when Vernon Isham was principal at that mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. the, uh, I have a brother who just passed away uh, recently, uh, Roger, my sister, one year younger, living in Lynchburg. Virginia? Uh, Virginia. And uh, tell us your sister's name, Miriam. Uh, Miriam. M I R I A M. Mm -hmm. And she.